Whenever I get the opportunity, I, I love letting young people in on a little secret. Every adult that they know is insecure. Every adult that they know has moments when they just feel like they're kids putting on big people's clothes. Um, they may look like they have it all together. They may look like they know what they're doing and where they're going and how to do it and they're competent and they're confident and but every adult that they know wrestles with insecurity. Um, I, is it just me? <laughs> I don't think so. I, I think we all do. We all wrestle with insecurity. And maybe there is a moment in time when this is no longer the case. Maybe there's a moment in our growing and maturing that we come to a place where we don't carry that level of insecurity, but I haven't reached it yet. Uh, I'm a 40 year old person in this world and I still struggle with insecurities. Um, the complexities of relationship, making a living, keeping a roof over heads, food on plates, the complexities of, of growing in your relationship with God, all these things can leave us sort of wanting, leave us sort of painfully aware of how unqualified we are to walk it out in this world. And so often we can feel out of our depth. We, we, we can feel like imposters in roles that we've been attributed. You know, I, I deal with imposter syndrome all the time. When I step into roles and responsibilities that I don't feel qualified for. And I want you to consider the fear, the anxiety, the worry that these feelings invite into our lives. Insecurity invites in fear, worry, anxiety, things that keep you up at night, things that live rent free in your mind. And I hope just calling this out for what it is, just just saying it out loud that we all deal with these kinds of insecurities can be cathartic for some of you. Uh, 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 maybe a moment of exhale as we kind of consider that we all struggle with these feelings of inadequacy, these feelings of not measuring up. And here's what I hope to do in this video. I, I hope to convince you that there is a way to overcome these feelings of insecurity, disqualification, these feelings of not being enough. There is a way and, and I hope as we kind of take this journey together that we will discover that there's a way. If you're taking notes, write this down. To grow in wisdom, you must know wisdom. To grow in wisdom, you must know wisdom. So stick with us. My name is Lucas, I'm one of the pastors here at Evangel Church. We're so glad that you joined us. And like I said, to grow in wisdom, you must know wisdom. We're in a series called Ancestry.jc. Now uh, we're just playing with this idea of going through the genealogy, Jesus family history. And today we ask the question, what can we learn from the life of a man named Solomon? So let's pray. Lord, as we dig into Solomon's life, as we dig into your word, as we seek to understand, as we seek to grow and to learn, Lord, Holy Spirit, would you see, would you lead and guide us in truth? Would you cause us to come alive to the things that are of you? And Lord, would you convict us, convince us, encourage us, capture our imaginations today? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, before we jump in, a little bit of history on Solomon. Uh, Solomon is the third king of Israel, the third king of Israel. Saul, and then there was David, and now David's son, Solomon. Uh, Solomon's rise to the throne was not uncontested. Uh, he actually had an older brother that was seeking the throne as well. And so we have a moment in the history uh, recorded in 1 Kings where David brings Solomon to him, 
commissions Nathan and some of the people around him to anoint Solomon king over Israel and seat him in the throne. And so David is both God's choice, or Solomon is both God's choice and David's choice for successor as king over Israel. Solomon was uh, the second born of David uh, through Bathsheba. Now we know the story of Bathsheba. David sinned. Uh, there's adultery. Uh, David murdered Bathsheba's husband. And so here we have this moment where Solomon comes along through this union between David and Bathsheba. Now, the uh, etymological study of the name Solomon leads us to kind of two different sources for what his name may mean. Now, one traces to the source of the word shalom, which of course means peace. Uh, this is interesting because much of Solomon's reign was marked by peace and prosperity. However, others trace the word to shilom, and shilom means to replace or restore. Uh, this is also appropriate, as you know, uh, the firstborn of David and Bathsheba died at birth. And so we have this kind of idea of Solomon coming around, along as, as one who replaces or restores what was lost. So this idea, this idea of restoring and replacing, it, it speaks to many things in terms of the goodness and the forgiveness and the faithfulness of God, despite our failures and our shortcomings. So, so both roots, they kind of play a part in Solomon's life and existence and history. But here's where we kind of want to land today. We want to explore um, the wisdom, the pursuit for understanding that Solomon had laid on his heart. So if you turn with us, 1 Kings chapter 3, 1 Kings chapter 3, Old Testament. Uh, if you don't have a Bible and would like to follow along with us, visit myevangel.church forward slash Bible. And there's a few ways that you can get a Bible in your hands like right now to follow along. So Solomon is a young king. Uh, he's somewhere between the age of 20 to 25 when he takes the throne. He's out of his depth. He knows it. He's self-aware enough to know it. And he is gone now to Gibeon where he has gone to this Gibeon's the high place, uh, one of the premier high places for uh, sacrifice. And at that time, the temp temple hadn't been finished yet. And so Solomon's going to Gibeon, the high place, to sacrifice before the Lord. So let's read First Kings uh, chapter 3, starting verse 5. At Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon in, in a dream by night. And God said, ask what I shall give you. And, all, and Solomon said, You have shown great and steadfast love to your servant David, my father, because, you walked before, because he walked before you in faithfulness, in righteousness, and in uprightness of heart toward you. And you have kept for him this great and steadfast love and have given him a son to sit on his throne this day. And now, O oh Lord my God, you have made your servant king in place of David, my father, although I am but a little child, I do not know how to come, to go out or to come in. And your servant is in the midst of your people whom you have chosen, a great people, too many to be numbered or counted for multitude. Give your servant, therefore, an understanding mind to govern your people, that I may discern between good and evil for who is able to govern this great people. Although I am but a little child, I do not know how to go out or to come in. There, there's something so impressive about this young man's self-awareness and humility before God. He, he positions himself in a way that, that just seeks God as his source and him just as a child, him with nothing to contribute, nothing to bring to the table. And I, and I can't help but kind of celebrate this. This is, this is honorable. This is humble. This is, we look at this moment and think of ourselves like Solomon, well done, young man. Well done to position yourself, to understand, to be self-aware enough to know that you don't have what it takes and you come to God and you ask for understanding. It's profound. It's honorable. And yet, how often do we resent ourselves in those moments of weakness and vulnerability when we don't have what it takes, when we feel that we are out of our depth, 
when we feel that we have nothing to bring to the table. It's funny how we do that, hey? It's funny how we honor and celebrate it in others, but for ourselves, we get angry and we get frustrated and we resent these moments of weakness that we have and that we carry. And as self-awareness dawns upon us, often many of us attribute shame to it rather than celebrating the opportunity to submit ourselves to the source of wisdom. Let, let me put this into something we can kind of feel, maybe a little more viscerally. Um, over the last, for those of you who have been with us in person, uh, over the last month and a half or so, we've had opportunities to come to the altar and respond to what God is doing in our hearts and be challenged by the word of God and, and bring response to that. And so we take moments where we step out of our seats and we come before an altar and we just pray and we position ourselves before God and seek what the Holy Spirit would have for us. And it's amazing how many times a call to the altar is a slow trickle. Have you ever been there? Because here's the thing, because we'll see other people go up. Let's say it's a call to repentance. It's a call to uh, address something of our brokenness, whether it's sin or weakness or needing strength or needing encouragement, whatever it may be. It's often an acknowledgement of our weakness and our need for God to fill something in our lives. And what we'll do, we'll sit back and we'll think to ourselves, I can't go up because people are going to judge me. Because what do we do? We attribute shame to our own weakness. But we see other people go up and we celebrate. We go, oh, God, meet with them. Do, do a work in them. We, we honor them and we go, wow, like what great humility. And we, we, we lift them up and we, yeah, we put ourselves down. And, and how many times have we seen an altar call where it's just a slow trickle of people? It takes that first, second, third person to respond before people feel comfortable to overcome their own shame and go forward to respond to what the Holy Spirit is doing. Church, can I, can I ask us, can we stop pretending? Can we stop pretending <laughs> like we have it all together, like we're not broken vessels in need of mending? Can, can we stop pretending that... that we somehow have it all together because it's moments like that, that we miss. We miss the opportunity for the spirit to fill something, to move something, to uh, heal something, to empower something, to inspire us with something. Like we miss those moments because shame has become our master. Shame is a horrible master because shame demands everything of us and gives nothing to us. So why do we celebrate those moments of people posturing in humility before God for others? But when it comes to us, we often attribute shame to it. Solomon, in his humility, in his self-awareness, makes this request of God. Keep in mind, God has given him carte blanche. God has said, ask whatever you will. Like Solomon can ask anything he wants of God and God is going to answer that prayer. And here's what he says. Give your servant, therefore, an understanding mind to govern your people, that I may discern between good and evil for who is able to govern this, your great people. Give me wisdom and understanding. Now, I think in this, this moment, we need to kind of parse out a little bit because we're given some clues as to what Solomon means by understanding. That I may discern between what? Between good and evil. That I may discern between sin and righteousness. What one could say, that I may discern between your way, God, and the way of my heart and the way of the world. Do you remember our one big thing? The thing I asked you to write down earlier? To grow in wisdom, you must know, capital W, wisdom. 
I want you to notice that capital W. It's not because I'm horrible at grammar, although I am, but this is purposeful. It's because I'm referring to wisdom personified. I'm referring to the source and the person of wisdom. God is the source of wisdom. He is wisdom. I've said it ad nauseum over the years. But if God is creator of all things, then he alone knows best how his creation operates in the world. The difference between good and evil is revealed through the nature of God. It's revealed through the character and the nature of who God is. And Solomon, in this moment, whether he fully realizes it or not, is asking that he might plumb the depths of God's nature in order to walk in wisdom in this world. Now, I promised earlier that there was going to be an escape, that that there's, there's steps to be taken in this time and in this world to begin to distance ourselves from the worry and the anxiety and the fear that our shortcomings and our insecurities produce. And here's where it's found. It's found in the pursuit of knowing wisdom personified. It's found in the pursuit of knowing God. And how do we know God? We know God through Christ Jesus, his son. If you are crippled with fear, if anxiety has a preeminent place in your life, I want to say this, and I want to say this carefully and with great empathy, Perhaps, perhaps you are spending too much time focusing on what you don't have than focusing on who you do have. Those of you in Christ, you want to overcome fear and anxiety and worry? Stop focusing on what you don't have, your insecurities your feelings of inadequacy, the fears and the unknowns of what's to come, and start focusing on who you do have. To grow in wisdom, you must know, capital W, wisdom. You must know him. You must know him. To walk away from your insecurities, your shortcomings and the sin, you you need to walk towards the one who has forgiveness, has the understanding and the power to overcome. Now, do you know the the difference between understanding and wisdom? Have you ever kind of considered this, the, the difference between what we would consider today understanding and what we would consider wisdom? Understanding is in, in a lot of ways very academic. It's theoretical. It's to know. It's to know. However, it's one thing to know, and it's another thing to apply it to our lives. Wisdom is more than just understanding. Wisdom includes understanding, but it also includes the critical next step, the application. The application of knowledge in our lives. But wisdom, it's more than that still. It's more than just the application of knowledge. Wisdom applies understanding with self-awareness. Andy Stanley, he had an entire series years ago that was based on this, this one big idea. In light of your past experience, your current circumstances, and your future hopes and dreams, what is the wise thing for you to do? I want to read that one more time. I want you to consider this filter. As we, as we seek to walk in wisdom, this filter can help. In light of your past experience, your current circumstances, and your future hopes and dreams, what is the wise thing for you to do? This is the self-awareness part of wisdom. You see, wisdom is nuanced. It's not just pragmatic. It's thoughtful. It accounts for relationship. It accounts for your pursuit of faith and God. It it accounts for the pursuit of your dreams and your future. It accounts for your past and how that shaped you. 
For some, walking into something is wise, and for others, that same thing can be unwise because of their past. And so it's nuanced. But at its very core, wisdom is found in the nature of who God is, because that's where we find right and wrong. That's where we find the ways of God. 1 Kings 9, 4 to 5, for, and, and as for you, if you will walk before me as David your father walked, with integrity of heart and uprightness, doing according to all that I have commanded you, and keeping my statutes and my rules, then I will establish your royal throne over Israel forever. Now here we see a word that's spoken over Solomon by God. It's very similar if you go back in 1 Kings and you look at David's blessing over Solomon, very similar wording. We see these words basically being spoken over and over within the kingship line. For the early part of Solomon's life, he lived this. He sought to walk in righteousness before God. He walked in profound wisdom. In fact, the, the kingdom at that under his rule prospered more than any other time. And there was wisdom. People came from all over the world. We have an account of the Queen of Sheba coming to learn from Solomon because his um, reputation had preceded him around the world. And so there's this kind of profound moment. And, and Solomon walked early in his kingship. He walked in this. And we see the profound fruit as Israel was positioned to be a, a thought leader, a, a place and a source of wisdom and knowledge, uh, revealing Yahweh as the one true God to the world, they were operating in what they were called to for much of Solomon's rule. But slowly there was an erosion. There was an erosion to Solomon's faithfulness to God. And it began... And it came about because of who he surrounded himself with. Craig Rochelle has a great um, saying. He says, show me your friends and I'll show you your future. In this case, in this case, it's, it's show me your wives and I'll show you your future. Because by the end, Solomon took seven. I know this is like incomprehensible, but Solomon took 700 wives and had 300 concubines. And many of the wives that he took were from foreign nations, nations that God had told the Israelites not to intermarry with because he knew, he knew that their religious practices would begin to infiltrate and influence the people of Israel. And yet Solomon, even in his great wisdom and understanding for his own life, began to intermarry. 700 princesses. Uh, crazy. And these were foreigners, many of them foreigners, who had other gods, other worship practices that were pagan and contrary to the way of Yahweh. And it influenced him. And he began to pull away from the worship of God and he began to diversify his worship to other gods and other pagan practices around him. And what's amazing is God ends up stripping Solomon of his kingdom. It's not until Solomon passes on to his son and his, his son's only one tribe remains. And that's only because God wanted to honor David. And so one tribe remained within the genealogy and the rulership of Solomon's family. The rest were given away because Solomon traded God's way for his way. And this is a reality that causes us to kind of take a moment of pause, a moment of reflection. The question perhaps that this presents us is, what is your pursuit? What is my pursuit? There are two types of promises God gives in Scripture. The first is what will happen if we walk in His way. He's got many beautiful promises of what will happen 
if we walk in his way, as we seek to know the nature of God, who he is, how he's designed us to live in this world and walk in his way, we see many beautiful promises of his faithfulness and his goodness towards us. But he also promises what will happen if we don't. If we walk in our own way, walk in our own wisdom, walk in the pursuit of our own heart or the heart of the world and the pursuits of the world. He shows us what will happen. And this is, this is not a threat. It's not that God is threatening us. He's simply stating a matter of fact. The natural consequences. The design of his creation. And what happens if we walk in our design or walk contrary to our design? Go in my way and you will, you will know fulfillment and peace and joy and prosperity in terms of the kingdom of God. Don't and you will know the consequences of sin. And we know ultimately that the consequences of sin is death. Luke eleven thirty one 31 says, the queen of the south, this is Jesus speaking. The queen of the south will rise up at the judgment with the men of this generation and condemn them. For she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And behold, something greater than Solomon is here. And of course, Jesus is referring to himself. Let, let, let me ask you today. Are you walking in wisdom? Are you walking towards wisdom? Are you growing in your relationship with capital W wisdom? In your pursuit of Jesus, are you growing in wisdom? To grow in wisdom, you must know wisdom. So today I want to give us an opportunity to just pause, to evaluate, to reflect, to respond to what the Holy Spirit is doing in our hearts and lives. We are all active participants in the preaching of God's word because there's an interaction with the Holy Spirit as, as God's word is proclaimed. So let me ask you this today. What is he speaking to you? What is he speaking to you? What areas of your life have you traded in the wisdom of the creator for the wisdom of your own heart? Can I, can I encourage you? Turn back to the nature of God. Turn back to the pursuit of wisdom as found in who he is and what he says is right and what he says is wrong. And that's where you're gonna find fulfillment and peace and joy and all the things that you've been pursuing. So Lord, in this moment, as we take time to reflect and evaluate, Lord, as we look at Solomon's life, Lord, we see this man who pursued wisdom, who walked in humility early in his reign, who wanted to know you, wanted to know your ways. But Lord, we also see a man who went off track, who allowed the influences of others to begin to reshape the way in which he lived in this world. Lord, help us to learn from Solomon. Help us to learn what it is to be humble before you and to ask for wisdom and understanding and knowledge. To ask for a grace to walk out what you've called us to. But also, Lord, would you guard our hearts from that slow, evolution of change that this world can bring if it captures our hearts. Would you guard us, Lord? Would you cause us to know wisdom, to know Jesus, to know his nature and his character in deeper measure, and the strength and the ability to walk that out in this world? We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, friends, thank you so much for joining us. And we hope that this is an encouragement to you and a challenge to you. And so go in God, go in grace. We'll see you next time.